please pray with me? Come to us, Holy Spirit, and make Christ known to us in this season of Epiphany. Make him present so we might be drawn to his light, just as the wise men were drawn to him. In the name of Jesus, amen. Today is the first Sunday in what will be a long season of Epiphany. Uh, Epiphany is that season from Christmas until Lent. And because Easter is so late this year, um, the season of Epiphany will be drawn out to about as long as it can be. Over the next few weeks, we're going to be uh, hearing the stories of those events that make the divinity of Christ show forth, uh, manifest in our world. Uh, in December, we had the season of Advent, which was waiting for the coming of Christ. And now Epiphany is kind of our reaction to Christ now that he's here. We'll have this story of the coming of the Magi, where uh, foreigners will be drawn to the Messiah of Israel. Next week will be the story of Jesus' baptism, followed the week after by Jesus' trial in the wilderness. And then for several weeks, we're going to be dwelling in the Sermon on the Mount from Matthew 5 through 7, where Jesus gives his teaching that he came not to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. And the Epiphany ends with Transfiguration Sunday, shortly before Ash Wednesday. So if the season of Advent was hoping in the dark, waiting for the coming of the light, Epiphany is our reaction now that the light is here, kind of like our candles here. Uh, now that the light of Christ is in our world, how do we reshape our lives, our perspective, based on the manifest presence of God in Jesus Christ? During this season of Epiphany, I've been in conversation with Pastor Matt Polk and uh, his intern, Vicar Maria, about doing a, a nine-week sermon series called All I Really Need to Know I Learned from Jesus. Uh, there's a kind of a brief introduction to that sermon series in your bulletin. Uh, but it's based on the Robert Fulgham uh, poem called All I Really Needed to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. Maybe you remember that. It's a few decades old now. There was a book by the same name. And part of what I like about uh, Fulgham's perspective is that uh, in our complex world, uh, he tries to boil down to some simple rules that help us make sense of how to live and how to be in the world. And so I thought, as a way of introduction into that series, I want to read for you that poem by Robert Fulgham. So he writes, all I really need to know about how to live, and what to do, and how to be, I learned in kindergarten. Wisdom was not at the top of the graduate school mountain, but there in the sand pile at school. These are the things I learned. Share everything. Play fair. Don't hit people. Put things back where you found them. Clean up your own mess. Don't take things that aren't yours. Say you're sorry when you hurt somebody. Wash your hands before you eat. Flush. Warm cookies and cold milk are good for you. Live a balanced life. Learn some and think some and draw and paint and sing and dance and play and work every day some. Take a nap every afternoon. When you go out in the world, watch out for traffic. Hold hands and stick together. Be aware of wonder. Remember the little seed in the styrofoam cup. The roots go down and the plant goes up, and nobody really knows how or why, but we are all like that. Goldfish and hamsters and white mice and even the little seed in the styrofoam cup, they all die, and so do we. And then remember the Dick and Jane books and the first word you looked. You learned. The biggest word of all, look. Everything you need to know is in there somewhere. The golden rule and love and basic sanitation, ecology and politics, inequality and sane living. Take any one of those items and extrapolate it into sophisticated adult terms and apply it to your family life or your work or your government or your world. 
that holds true and clear and firm. Think what a better world it would be if we all, the whole world, had cookies and milk about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and then laid down with our blankies for a nap. Or if all governments had as a basic policy to always put things back where they found them, and to clean up their own mess. And it is still true, no matter how old you are, when you go out into the world, it is best to hold hands and stick together. Folger, when he talked about uh, this poem that he wrote, he thought that it might sound overly simplistic to some people. But he thinks that it's not so much simple as it is elemental. That is, we have all these sophisticated adult ways of making sense of the world, but if you take those sophisticated concepts and boil them down, you get some of these same truths. Share everything. Play fair. Don't hit people. And so for the season of Epiphany, we're going to be taking some of these elemental truths that we learn in our life and placing them next to the manifest truth in Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. So today we are pairing, when you go out in the world, watch out for traffic, hold hands and stick together with this story of the wise men, of King Herod, of Jesus, Flying, uh, being taken to safety in Egypt. So part of what strikes me in today's reading, uh, and you can look on with me if you would like, so we're referring to a few pieces, is that as Jesus comes into the world and makes God known in the world, there seem to be two equally strong reactions. Some people, and not always the people you would expect, are going to be drawn to Jesus. Just as those wise men from the East, the Magi, were in today's story. But some people are not going to be drawn to Jesus, but are rather going to be repelled by him, afraid of what he means for their life, like King Herod in today's story. We get these both at the same time in the same story. And I think when we're honest with ourselves, there's a little bit of both in our own heart. Some will be drawn to Jesus, and some will be repelled by Jesus. <coughs> What's interesting about the story of the Magi, and Magi uh, might mean something like wise men or maybe astrologer, someone who pays attention to the stars, looking for signs in the stars, is that they are outside of the family of Abraham, and yet they are drawn to the light, drawn to Jesus. That will be a theme over and over again in Matthew's Gospel. <coughs> And they come bearing gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gifts for a king, but also king, uh, also gifts for someone who might eventually die. These would be, have been used in a burial ceremony as well. So right here in the beginning, we have this uh, sign of what's coming for Jesus. That as he enters the world, he will be a king, but he will also be called to die. And then we have King Herod. Uh, king Herod hears from the wise men that a new king has been born. They've seen it in the stars, and they're going to see him. But what does that mean for Herod? If there's a new king, what happens to him and his power? He tells the wise men, as soon as you find him, let me know. I want to go and worship him too. But he doesn't mean it, does he? He means to kill this new baby king. He means to abolish this threat to his power. What the Magi recognize is what scares King Herod, that there is a new Lord in our world. But as Jesus enters the world, if it means he is Lord, it means Herod is not. If Jesus is Lord, that means we cannot be Lord of our own lives. Jesus' lordship is a threat to anything that would try to control our life. If Jesus is lord, money and the market is not. If Jesus is lord, that means that uh, prestige and reputation and being popular are not. If Jesus is lord, that means any political party, any ruler is not. 
So the coming of Jesus, the Messiah, is not good news for everyone. Some people will be drawn to him, and some will be repelled by him. And what does Herod do? Herod, we, you know, we tell this kind of cute story of the three wise men coming to visit the newborn king, but we often forget the part after that, which is when Herod uh, <coughs> sends out his uh, henchmen to kill all of the baby boys in Bethlehem. Oh, an awful story. The slaughter of the innocent. And I think as we hear that, we're meant to think of Pharaoh and Moses as well. If you remember from the early chapters of, Pharaoh, of, of Exodus, the same thing happened when Pharaoh thought that the Hebrews were becoming too populous. He sent out an order to kill all <laughs> the baby boys. So we have Pharaoh, we have Herod, all these tyrants of the world who think they're in charge but we have this newborn king, who is the true Lord of the universe. What is true for Christ will eventually be true for his followers, which means you, which means me. There's a, a hymn that we sing sometimes here, it's in our hymnal, it's called The Summons. The first line is, will you come and follow me if I but call your name? Will you go where you don't know and never be the same? It's about Jesus' call for each one of us to follow him. But that him also has a reminder that just as some were attracted to Jesus and some were repelled to him, the same thing will happen to us as we follow in his ways. There's a verse in that hymn that says, Will you risk the hostile stare should your life attract or scare? Are we willing to follow Jesus, knowing that some people are going to be drawn to those ways, and some will be repelled by them? Will you risk the hostile stare, should your life attract or scare? So as Jesus enters the world, we notice that he is not alone. It's like that truth from Robert Fulgham. When you go out in the world, it is best to hold hands and stick together. When Jesus and his family were driven from uh, the promised land into Egypt, they did not go alone. That God himself, God incarnate, relied on human parents to go with him to safety. This is the story of how our Lord himself became a refugee. By definition, someone forced from their home under threat of violence. As he came into the world, he had to stick together for safety. And likewise, as we go into the world, we are sent out together. But even more, and this is the good news for us today, that in Jesus Christ, the one we call Emmanuel, which is means God is with us, we go out into the world holding hands not just with each other, but with Christ himself. We go out into the world sticking together not just with each other, but with God in the flesh himself. That's what we might add to this wisdom, this kindergarten wisdom, is this promise of Christ. That as Christ becomes known to us in the season of Epiphany, when we go out into the world, we do not go alone. We hold hands with the Savior himself. We stick together with the body of Christ, with the presence of Christ in our world. So when you go today, it is best to stick together, to hold hands, to be of good courage. Because when we go into the world, some will be attracted and some will be repelled. Will you risk the hostile stare should your life attract or scare? Because that's what happens to Christ himself. And the promise for us, the good news for us, is that when you go out into the world, it is best to hold hands with your Savior. It is best to stick together with the body of Christ. So as the star shines above the manger, as the light shines in our world, may we be drawn to the light of Christ as the wise man. And may we hold hands with him and stick together as we go out into the world. Amen.
Please stand as you are.